Well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, whichever it is for you. Uh, welcome to Chapter 4 of Court Procedure and Evidence here at Wake Tech. Uh, this is the Spring 2023 uh, semester, and we're working our way through our text um, for these lectures, for those of you online or those of you that are seated or taking the hybrid and just want to uh, catch up with the lectures or maybe get uh, a few points clarified. So this uh, chapter, uh, chapter four, is going to be focusing on stop and frisk, uh, which is, it's hard to, to say, uh, uh, to, um, you know, qualify how important stop and frisk is to both law enforcement and how many cases there were. Um, some of the issues that it raises, it's probably one of the central issues in uh, evidence in court uh, that we see. Uh, in the 21st century America. So we're going to be looking at a number of Supreme Court cases. We're going to look at the ones that, of course, kind of created the stop and frisk exception, I guess we could call it, or uh, realization. And then we'll move into uh, a numbers that have modified it. So um, <clears throat> to proceed here, the um, the power to stop in question is, of course, something that is done very often in law enforcement. Uh, what you're looking for very often in law enforcement is something that is breaking a pattern if the pattern is one of law-abiding or uh, just. So the, the power um, was, was very, very broad um, until a, a more egalitarian society, a more equal society began to emerge in the 1960s. Now of course, some people are going to argue that um, outsiders um, need protection from the police. And of course, the police are going to argue that it's difficult to do their job if they can't do these types of stop and frisk. So again, like much of this chapter and much of what we talked about, we've got a balancing act going on. Um, they, the, the police are going to say, well, we need this in order to keep you safe. And the public's going to say, we need to have limits on it so that we don't wind up in a totalitarian state. Um, so, of course, when we have this kind of balance and, and conflict between groups, uh, we turn first to the Constitution of the United States. And particularly here, we're going to look at the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. Um, the, the Fourth Amendment... Um, if you read it strictly, I guess you could argue, um, could be a real problem for those police officers or those agencies that want to have stop and frisk. Um, if you say that a stop is um, falls under the Constitution uh, of a search, remember we've got arrest warrants and search warrants that we talked about uh, in our last lecture, then you're going to need a warrant for a lot of this or you're going to need probable cause. And very often the police do not have the level of, I guess you could call it suspicion, to probable cause. So Fourth Amendment stops are here, very brief detentions that allow the police to free someone and investigate suspicious uh, activity. So these Fourth Amendment frisks are pat-downs of typically outer clothing done to protect the officers in order to take away a suspect's weapons. So um, part of this is, of course, a realization that the police are doing a dangerous job and that they need to have a degree of protection. And that protection needs to, uh, you know, sometimes put some limits on the application of the Constitution. So what are Fourth Amendment stops? Well, these are going to be the least intrusive. Um, the Fourth Amendment searches of persons include everything from pat-downs to invasive. So I, I would say that, you know, no stop is, uh, um, every stop, I guess, is probably unique. And we need to appreciate that uh, there are going to be unique factors surrounding every search. Um, it, it's, you know, if, you've, if you come across someone in, in the wintertime who's wearing bulky clothing, a uh, coat and a vest and uh, long pants, uh, there's lots of opportunities to hide weapons there. There's lots of reasons for the police to be concerned about their own safety. If you come across someone in the summertime, you know, at the beach and uh, all the guy has on is a, a, a pair of swim trunks, 
then the odds of him having a weapon are, are very low. Uh, and there, there's going to be two different searches that can happen there. So the facts surrounding the stop and frisk are very important. Um, now one of the things that we have to appreciate is that officers stop a great many people um, without finding anything, um, anything illegal. In, in fact, finding weapons is a exception to the rule. Uh, there are different numbers that we could look at um, depending upon where stop and frisk has been studied and what you're going to include in it. but. Um, no more than about 5% of stop and risk typically are going to result in some sort of arrest and weapons are going to be found at a much lower level than you might think. And the most commonly found weapon, of course, is not going to be a gun, which is a projection of power, uh, but a knife, which is still a very dangerous weapon. Um, so we, we have, um, you know, both law breakers and law briders and they can exist in different environments and th and this shades or colors how we apply the stop and risk rules are you in a very safe neighborhood a very secure area a uh, very nonviolent area i think that you know the the basis for your stop and frisk probably has to be a little bit higher if you're in a dangerous area <coughs> um, then no i mean i think stop and frisk um, are probably going to be applied more rigorously now there, again, there can be a problem with that. One of the obvious problems is uh, because of the nature of American society, very often ethnic minorities and racial minorities are going to be more prevalent in these areas of high crime, uh, which means you're going to have an unequal uh, or disproportionate searching of uh, minorities, and both racial and ethnic minorities. And then you're going to get in the issue of separating out well at what point is this dealing with um, that the reason for the search was because of their ethnicity or is it because of the neighborhood which is sometimes because of their ethnicity um, so you know what is the danger here and when do we go from this is uh, really uh, a neutral approach where we're searching to one of, well, this is a prejudicial approach. Well, I think in order to start answering some of those questions, we have to look at stop and frisk. So what's the law? Stop and frisk law allows a slight alteration of the three-step analysis to decide if you have a search. So one of the things we're, we're going to ask is, is it a stop or frisk? Um, and was this stop or frisk reasonable? If it was unreasonable, if there's no basis for the stop and frisk, the same rules are going to be applied that we see applied to a regular search, um, not under this broad cover of stop and frisk. So typically we're going to exclude it. So um, what, the, what the courts are going to look at is the degree in which um, you are invading someone's privacy. So take, take a stop and frisk where a police officer stops um, an individual, detains him for less than five minutes, pats down the outer part of his clothing, does not reach in, does not touch his flesh or her flesh, is not intrusive. That's at one end of the stop and frisk. Now consider a more detailed stop and frisk where a police officer is reaching inside uh, or patting down or squeezing um, or, or you know touching uh, an individual very intrusively even to the point of okay are you are you searching inside body cavities you know at what point you know I don't think that's gonna be a stop and frisk obviously but at what point does the search become so intrusive we say well this has really gone beyond stop and frisk and this is a full-blown search um, so obviously a police officer, if it's just a stop and frisk, needs less suspicion, needs less evidence, I guess we could say, than he would if he was ready to make an arrest and conduct a full-born search. Um, and I think you also have to keep in mind that we do not operate, the police in particular do not operate in a vacuum, and that there is a public visibility issue here. If the general public sees that the police are constantly stopping one group, 
or that they are more abrupt or abrasive in treating one group. And, and so we don't necessarily walk into a minefield here. Let's just take the issue of gender. Uh, now this is often when we talk about stop and frisk you'll hear me and others very frequently talk about well what's the ethnic group that's being stopped and frisked or what's the racial group but consider for a second gender uh, now we know uh, according to uh, most of the good statistics that if we look at the most violent crime people commit which would be a homicide um, that men commit this at vastly disproportionate rates than women so the one of the most common weapons that is used in committing a homicide is a firearm and then we have knives and other deadly weapons so consider a situation how should a police officer treat someone they are stopping at frisk if they're male versus how should they treat someone if they're female uh, and what you're what you're going to find is there are far more stops generally and frisk of males than females and i think you also have an issue of, uh, when you start to look at gender, you also have issues about, well, are you sexualizing this in any ways? If a male police officer is frisking a female, is, um, you know, is that appropriate? Do you need females to frisk females? And reverse it, if a female police officer frisks a male, do we look at it with the same suspicion? So there's lots of issues that come up here. So, and I, I use the term suspicion because we're gonna, uh, we're gonna transition here and start talking about reasonable suspicion, which is what a police officer has to have. It can't simply be, um, oh, you know, it's, uh, it's a Wednesday on board, I want to pat someone down to see if I find a weapon. So, uh, if we look at reasonable suspicion, a police officer at a convenience store or a gas station at 2.30 a.m. sees two women come into the station and buy some items. As they walk by, he smells alcohol. Um, they go to the car and get in. And he asks the driver at this point, um, you know, to do a sobriety test. And the, the driver is deemed to be intoxicated. Now, is there reasonable suspicion here? Uh, well, part of the problem is, okay, two women walk by him you know, and he smelled alcohol, well, which one had it? And if you said, well, one of them had to, well, you know, whoop de doo you walk into a room and there's a body on the floor and there's five people there that might have uh, been the person that did it, and you arrest all five, or you search all five, can you really do that? You know, um, here there's, there's no reasonable suspicion because both women had passed him, and he didn't know which one. So without this reasonable suspicion, and this is the case of Wisconsin versus Mayor, there's, there's really a limited right to stop, which is somewhat surprising. I also think that, you know, this is, again, one of those issues, although it's not talked about in your book, and it's, it's not something that is routinely used, uh, that we uh, routinely talk about, is that it is a gender issue. Um, again, there, there's, there's all sorts of issues surrounding that. There's a there's a graph in your book on page 120 where it looks at stops per seizure for Hispanics and whites and this is in New York City over about an eight-year period and what you're gonna find is um, there were in this uh, one example there was 2.3 million stops okay so let's just round that to, to 2 million and there was about 16,000 seizures which again, you can see that it's a very small percentage where the suspicion is borne out. And then if you look at um, Hispanics, you're going to see 1.4 million uh, stops. Uh, the, the stops per seizure is about 99. Um, the stop procedure for blacks is 143. The stop procedure for whites though is much higher. It's actually 27. There was only in New York City 435,000 stops but there were 16,000 seizures. So, you know, somewhat uh, against counterintuitively, we could say that you're probably better off stopping a white person because you're going to find more contraband weapons primarily. Although the major thing found, I want to emphasize, is not weapons, uh, particularly for whites. The major thing found for, for whites was drugs, about 60% of the time. For Hispanics, drugs again, about 54%. Only when you get to African Americans or blacks do you start to see uh, 
finding more weapons. And again, the most common weapon is not a gun. Uh, that's very rarely found. It's almost never found uh, in white searches. Uh, and it's rarely found in Hispanic searches. Uh, it's only found in about 25% uh, of African American searches. Um, but let's move on from that. We don't want to get too bogged down here. Okay, so um, that's that reasonable suspicion, sorry. Let's look at the fundamental analysis. So we have the reasonableness clause, and then we have the warrant clause. So there's two approaches to this analysis. The reasonableness clause says, and this is from the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, their houses, their papers and effects against, and here's the key word, unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And then there is added on to this slightly afterwards, and no warrant shall be issued, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation. Now, if you were arguably a strict constructionalist, if you read this literally, you would say, well, okay, it says persons, so you can't conduct a search which is unreasonable and it says you know you're gonna to have to have a warrant here seemingly and no warrants shall be issued but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation so any search you're going to do even of a person if you strictly read the Constitution you could argue that that would really kill the idea of stop and frisk now um, the courts have never gone that far I think for lots and lots and lots of reasons but they've certainly never embraced that um, Instead, there's always been this, yes, you have this right, but this right is limited. And I think this is really important to understand. Whether you're talking about search and seizure, or you're talking about freedom of the press, or the Second Amendment rights to own guns, there are always limits on rights. Um, no right is absolute, because eventually any right begins to conflict with other rights. And you're going to have to draw lines between the two. So the conventional approach uh, which was used um, <clears throat> was that the warrant and reasonableness clause were very firmly con connected and only reasonable searches and seizures with a warrant were allowed. But this began to change and it's going to change in a, in a major case probably if you're going to learn one case coming out of court procedure and evidence it's going to be the Terry case and we'll get to it in one second. But in 1960, the court really shifted and said the warrantness, the warrant requirement and the reasonableness requirement are separate. So what it did is it went in and started to divide up what previously we had looked at a, as a whole. The warrant clause only comes into play where warrants are obtained and not every search requires probable cause. Not every search needs a warrant, therefore. So what the court is doing is saying some searches are not really, I would say, are not really searches is what the Supreme Court is saying. They're stops and they're frisks. So obviously if you're going to adopt this, you're going to have to really under, understand and you're going to have to develop a test. And what they did was they said most searches and seizures are warrantless. And these warrantless searches have to pass what they called the reasonableness test. And this requires a balancing. Do you have a need to search versus what's the need of liberty and privacy? Again, as we started this chapter, we talked uh, at the beginning about how, you know, you want to be safe and you want to be free. Uh, and those two things have to be placed in balance. So what the court wants to know is, are there enough facts and circumstances to back up the search, to make it reasonable? If it isn't, if the reason the search occurred was the police officer was bored or the police officer was prejudiced or the police officer was drunk, I don't care, make up whatever would make it unreasonable you want, then the search is not reasonable. Now this is really going to call for a case-by-case -case analysis with some overarching ideas. So the court has to decide in each case applying the totality of circumstances which means okay tell us everything about the case that's important you don't have to tell me when the guy was born or you don't have to tell me you know what his zodiac sign is but tell me what time of night was it 
Where was he? Uh, how was he acting? Give me everything. Now, uh, some searches require very individualized suspicion. And I would say the more innocent looking it is on the surface, the more proof you're going to need. And the more suspicious a person would say things were, the less proof you're going to need. Um, so today's approach really grew out of how do we deal with the public square? Because if a police officer wants to do a stop and frisk in your house, he's not going to be able to. The, the stop and frisk is going to apply when people are in public. And remember, we talked about a little earlier in some previous cases where you have a lesser expectation of privacy when you're in public. So your constitutional rights are strongest against search and seizure when you're in your home. But when you go out in your public, when you're driving your car, when you're walking at the mall, when you're shopping at the grocery store, your expectation of privacy is lowered. And conversely, the right of the rest of us through the police to be safe, okay, is raised. So what you do in your house, I don't have a lot of say in. What you do in the Kroger, I have a little bit more influence in. So um, today's stop and frisk laws grew out of these practical problems. Now, I, I don't like to talk a lot about preventing crime. I think um, when we talk about the police, and I think this is a very common fallacy, and I'm going to get up on a soapbox for one minute. Uh, but, you know, I, I get, I get um, because I'm a criminal justice instructor and a lawyer, I get questioned a lot about the police and, you know, how they can fight crime. I, I think what's most important to remember is that most of the time the crime has already occurred. What the police are doing is they're not preventing. There is some police prevention. There is some deterrence. But what the police, by and large, are doing is investigating crime. So I, I really wish your book had separated out these two things. Um, now this next case, ironically, is very much a prevention case as opposed to an investigative case. But I, I, I do think it's worth considering, has a crime occurred and the police are looking at suspects, or is there a potential for a crime to occur? I would say when there's potentiality, the police are gonna have to have a little bit more basis for their stop. If the crime's already happened, I think they can have a little bit less. Um, and you do have to remember, too, that usually officers are dealing with people they don't know and probably will never see again or, or, or bump into. If you're a police officer in Raleigh, you know, there's a million people in Raleigh or the greater Raleigh area. What's the odds that you're going to bump into the same person? It can happen. So since, it's, since you don't know the individual, you're going to have to rely upon your overall professional training. All right, so uh, without any more ado, let's look at the important case here, the case that, as I said, you're probably going to want to know as opposed to any other case you're going to learn uh, with a possible exception or two in this course, and that's Terry v. Ohio. So um, we have Officer McFadden, who is a uh, veteran of the police department. He's, he's uh, you know, he's... As I recall, he had a lot of years. Um, I think, it, it, believe it or not, he um, he had been on the force, I think, 39 years, uh, which is horrifically long, and a detective for 35. And believe it or not, he as a detective, he was still going to be assigned to patrolling an area. And this is in Cleveland, Ohio. So even though it's Terry v. Ohio, it takes place in Cleveland. So this, in, in 1963... Um, he's patrolling an area, and he's standing on the corner of, I believe it's Huron and uh, Euclid Avenue. And he sees uh, two men, um, and they're, they're, he, he's aware that he's in downtown Cleveland, and there's shoplifters and pickpockets. And he, as I said, with his very long experience, he notices these two, and they seem to be acting suspicious. Uh, and they... They, uh, he, he goes to a storefront and standing about three or 400 feet away from them, he watches them. And he notices that they go back and forth in front of some stores. They pause for a moment at the store window, walk a short distance, then come back. 
you know, they really seem to be, I guess, if we use an old term, casing the joint. So he sees these two men, later three men, he is suspicious. Now, this is 1963. This is before police officers are going to carry uh, communication devices on them, whether we're talking about, at first, uh, walkie-talkies or radios in the car. But remember, he's on foot patrol or, uh, or even more advanced technology now. So he's alone. He's out there. Um, it's 2.30 uh, in the afternoon. So he's suspicious when he starts to see them. And he, he sees them do this five or six times, and, and he decides after about 10 or 12 minutes that um, he's going to follow them. So he, he goes after them, and again, they do some more reconnaissance of the store window in Huron, and he becomes convinced they're doing a, a casing job. And he stops them, and now he pats them down. So we have a stop. That's where we get the stop because he, he holds them, okay? He tells them to stop. They stop. And then he frisks them. Now, what's he frisking them for? He, he, he's frisking them for weapons. And they were carrying firearms. Now, here's the problem. They are felons, and they are not allowed to have... They're not allowed to have guns. Um, he, he, I think it was a 38 caliber, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so he found, um, I think two of them had weapons on them, if I'm not mistaken. And he, he said the only reason I patted them down was to see whether they had weapons. Um, he didn't do an intrusive search. He didn't put his hands inside. He just felt for metal objects. He seizes the guns. Um, he calls the paddy wagon, the police wagon, takes them all three down, and they're charged with carrying a concealed weapon because none of them had a concealed uh, permit at this point. And it turns out they were all felons and not allowed to believe to hold guns at all. So they say uh, when they go to trial and these weapons are admitted against them as evidence, we want to appeal this decision. Um, and we think it's an unreasonable search. Now, uh, it takes a few years. In 1968, excuse me, in 1968, it goes up to the Supreme Court. And on June 10th, 1968, Earl Warren writes the majority opinion. Um, the police officers needs to protect themselves outweigh the limited intrusion here. There was no need for probable cause. But one thing he did say was you need reasonable suspicion to both stop the individuals and frisk them. You can have a suspicion to stop them and going back to that, that imaginary guy in his bathing suit at the beach. You can have a reasonable suspicion to stop someone, but that would not necessarily give you the right to frisk since you can look at him and say, well, he doesn't have a gun. He doesn't have a knife. Um, so this is, the reasonable suspicion should apply to both the initial stop and the frisk. Um, and, and this decision, there is a dissent um, by Justice Douglas, who was one of the uber liberals really back in the, the 60s. Um, but it's an eight to one decision. It's very well established law. So what's the rationale here? One of the things they said, this is a very minor stop. This is a couple of seconds. They are freezing the situation. It is not, we're going to take you downtown and search you. It's not, we're going to put you in a jail cell. This is a brief moment where you pat someone down. You're not intruding into their clothing for a weapon. And because this is very minor, we need less information. You don't need that reasonable basis for arrest. You don't need probable cause. You just really need to be able to articulate why you're stopping them. So you're, you're freezing it to see if there is a crime. Now, it doesn't end there. Because like any good tool, if a tool exists, People want to expand, you know, what else can I use this for? So this next slide I made is going to give you an idea of how it kind of expands. Um, so in 1972, we have the case of Adams versus Williams, in which it said, well, the police can use information from an informant uh, for the stop and frisk. So if a police officer didn't see people acting suspicious, but if he had an informant in who said, hey, they're acting suspicious, that can be enough. By 1983, Michigan versus Long, uh, 
Uh, this allows searches of car compartments with reasonable suspicion. So again, you're out driving your car, there's a lower expectation of privacy there. Hibble versus the 6th Judicial District Court of Nevada allowed state law, okay, mandating that a suspect identify themselves not to be seen as a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So in Nevada, um, they say, you know, you have to identify yourself if you're stopped. This is not a violation of the Fourth Amendment. 2009, uh, this is Arizona versus Johnson. Police can conduct pat-downs of passengers if they lawfully stop someone for a minor traffic violation. Um, if, again, because you've got the stop, that's the detention, now is it reasonable to pat them down? Are you reasonably worried they might be armed? And finally, a North Carolina case, um, the police, this is a really interesting case, the police, uh, police officer in North Carolina stopped a uh, car that um, had a broken taillight. Now, the police officer believed incorrectly that in North Carolina you have two functioning brake lights. And he only had one, but the, the North Carolina Motor Vehicle Statute said one is sufficient. So in fact, this is really interesting, the police officer had no lawful basis to make the stop. So they searched and they found some coke, cocaine, and the Heinlein, uh, Heinlein uh, appeals. And the Supreme Court of the United States said, well, if he reasonably believed that the stop was reasonable, okay, it doesn't matter. The search is upheld. This is kind of a surprise to me, I'll be honest. Of, of these five cases here that we're going to look at, this is the one I have really one of the hardest times justifying. Because, you know, my rationale is any civilian really is assumed to know all the law. You know, you can't say, well, I didn't know it was against the law to spit in the sidewalk. Well, it is. Well, I never knew that. Doesn't matter. You're going to jail. If, you, if we can require this to bring people into custody, I think we can require it of police officers to know the actual law to conduct these searches. But to be fair, the Supreme Court of the United States disagrees with me, and um, you know they pretty much win. So uh, as much as your professor here might have a problem with that, uh, not so much. So we, we've got um, these opinions, and these opinions unsurprisingly are written after the end of the Warren Court. So in 1972, that, that Adams versus Williams case, that's a case that is written by Rehnquist. Rehnquist becomes the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He's appointed by Richard Nixon, becomes Chief Justice eventually, but he writes, he writes that opinion. Um, and then as we go on, 83, 2004, 2009, 2014, you know, the, um, the, uh, the uh, Hildebell decision, for example, in 2004. That's a decision by uh, Justice Kennedy uh, with uh, dissent. There is a dissent in 2004. Um, I think Breyer and Sotomayor, I think Ginsburg wrote a dissent on that as, a, as well. But, you know, these are all um, very interesting cases, I think. Um, let me just go ahead and move on here to the next one. Stop and frisk must be reasonable. The need to control crime is deemed to be simply more important than a very minor intrusion that happens. Now, you know, to be fair, um, your minor intrusion is my gross invasion of my privacy. So if an individual is being stopped by the police, they feel it's, it's, it's huge. Um, if you just hear about it, you think it's minor. And the court has to look at this objectively. Any action, though, any stop and frisk has to be backed up with facts. You better be able to articulate why you're stopping. Remembering, of course, excuse me while I drink my coffee, is that the stop and the frisk are two different things, each supported by reasonable suspicion. Um, if you stop someone where it's almost impossible they have a weapon, your frisk is going to be very limited. Um, so the stop is really the first thing. Do you have the reason to stop them? If you don't have the reason to stop them, but once they're in custody, you have a reason to frisk them. If you can't get through the stop, then the frisk is not going to be supportable. Um, and, and the big thing we're concerned here 
uh, at least the, in particular the courts are concerned here, legitimately so, is the safety of the police officers. The police are entitled to a reasonable level of personal security. And they are particularly ha have the right to search potentially violent and dangerous suspects. Now remember, I, I, I talked a little bit about searches of, we, we mentioned blacks and Hispanics and whites, but let's, let, and then I said, well, let's talk about gender. You know, why are there so many gender searches? Are they dangerous? Okay, you know, can a police officer take into account someone's gender when they worry about their own safety? Now, obviously there are uh, women out there who are quite capable of uh, protecting themselves or inflicting pain on other people. You know, they might be black belts. My, my daughter happens to be a, a black belt in Taekwondo and um, she, you know, is potentially dangerous uh, even unarmed. Uh, but by and large, um, looking at something, not knowing the person, who would you say is more dangerous? A woman or a man in a situation and things being equal the man is more dangerous if we look at the statistics of homicide if we look at the statistics of who carries weapons if we look at the statistics of who commits crimes of violence clearly the man is more dangerous so the police officer can take that into account and I think that in part explains that issue I brought up of why there are differences in gender search now as I said Terry's been expanded um, when you have a hammer, if, and this is an old Japanese proverb, every problem looks like a nail, and I kind of changed it a little bit. One of the things, to be fair, because uh, I think I've been trying to support the police here, is that the police have used the right to conduct Terry stops in more and more situations to extend their power. Very, very few stops result in arrests. Um, most of those arrests are not for firearms. They are for drugs. And for example, and there's some statistics there in Washington, D.C., only 0.8% of stops led to any weapon being seized, which means if you can say, well, are, are these stops reasonable in a greater statistical sense? Well, 98, no, 99.2% of the time, no, they're not. And that would, you know, raise serious questions, you know. Are we searching too much? Um, are we searching the wrong people? Um, I think you can make a stronger argument if we go back to those statistics uh, when we looked at uh, the New York City statistics in the 2000s when we looked at stop and frisk of the different groups. Remember, we looked at statistics for uh, African Americans, for Hispanics and whites. You know, there... Uh, I think it was being applied in such a way that they were finding weapons, um, you know, at, at a decent rate. Um, when you looked at the the rates when you're finding them among African Americans, yeah, they're finding them more commonly, but they're conducting so many more searches. So the percentage of searches of blacks that are leading to weapons is, is going to be lower than the percentage of searches of, of whites. Okay, so let's move on and talk about Fourth Amendment stops some more. The police must be reasonable in the totality of the circumstances. Objectively, looking at it from the outside, from the top to bottom, is there a basis for the stop and does that add up to reasonable suspicion? If the police officer says, well, I just stopped him because it was a Wednesday, it's a bad stop. If the police officer says, I stopped him because um, he was too tall, it's not a good stop. Where you start to have issues are is when the police officer says, I stopped him because he looked out of place in that community. Well, that's, uh, that becomes very thin ice. You know, that, that becomes something like, well, are you profiling there? Is profiling okay? You know, and the instinctive answer I would say now is, well, no, profiling is not okay. But really, I said a minute ago that men commit far more acts of violence, aren't you profiling when you stop a man as opposed to a woman? So consider this circumstance, and, and this really is more an arrest circumstance than a stop and frisk, but I, I think it, it gives you a degree of perspective for it. You are a police officer, you walk uh, up and there is a man lying on the ground who's been brutally stabbed. Uh, obviously whoever did it had a fair amount of power, 
and there are two people uh, standing over him, a man and a woman, both the same height. Um, they're both, say, five six, and they start to run in opposite directions. Now, you can only chase one. They look the same size. They look the e equally capable, but you have to make a decision at this point as a police officer, who do you chase? And I think most police officers would chase the man because they know, of course, that men commit more acts of violence. Now, you might be wrong. It might have been the woman that did it. The man might have been walking down the street and saw this and you know, saw the cop came up and said, I don't want to be involved in this and took off. So, you know, I, I do think we have to objectively look at things, but I, it's never as clear and clean as we might like. Okay. Stops must be based on reasonable suspicion supported by articulable facts, not prejudice, not innate bias. Now, it is not prejudice, which is prejudgment, to say men commit more crimes than women, therefore I am more suspicious of men. There's a fact that underlies that. That fact can be overturned if it turns out that the woman actually committed that crime. This is assessed through a totality of circumstances. Look at everything and ask yourself, does it meet it? Now, the scope of the reasonable stop. Two elements here. One, short duration. The courts have never said you've got five minutes and 27 seconds. What they have said is it can't be a prolonged period of time. It can't go on and on and on. Um, now, the next one is something I think that illustrates how sometimes um, that old adage, that Japanese proverb, every if you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, on the spot investigation. Remember, this is for the safety of the officer. Well, suppose the officer says, I want to pat them down, but I can't do it safely in this location. I want to put them in a paddy wagon, or I want to handcuff them, or I want to put them in the back of the squad car, or, and there were some cases of uh, urban police departments doing this, I believe Philadelphia did this in one case, I know New York City did, where they would go out they would find someone, they would feel, we're going to put them in a, a paddy wagon, a police wagon, take them downtown, do the stop and frisk there, and then release them. You know, I think you're going way out on a limb there. An officer can move suspects short distances, but generally, it better be where the stop occurs. Unless you've got a really good reason why you're going to move them, it's got to be there on the spot. Okay building up this reasonable suspicion some more, um, what's the best? Well, the best is direct information. What do you see? What do you know firsthand as the police officer? Having said that, a lot of what the police learn when the commission of crimes is hearsay. Facts and circumstances that you learn from a victim or a witness or another police officer or a professional or paid informant or an anonymous informant. So you're going to get this information that's going to allow you really to make decisions. Now in a courtroom hearsay, which we'll talk about a little bit in this um, in this course, um, is you know there's limited admissibility of it. But out on the streets to build reasonable suspicion, hearsay is much more readily available because much of what we do every day is based on hearsay. You know, if, if you're at the movie theater and your friend goes up and says, what time does the movie play? And the guy says it comes on at 2 o'clock, and he comes back to you and you say, what time does the movie play? And he says 2 o'clock. You're going to hearsay. But you're going to rely upon it, right? Now, obviously hearsay for crime, a little bit more questionable. So let's look at what's sometimes called levels of proof. And we're really starting to build towards how this is going to be deployed in the courtroom. So we can have no evidence. Now, in, in that case, there's no guilt. Then you can have just a little bit of evidence, okay? A scintilla, as it said. That's not going to be enough to stop someone. Now, the next step is reasonable suspicion. This is going to be enough for a Terry stop. Can you articulate why someone might have committed a crime? Probable cause is what you need to make an arrest. Preponderance of the evidence is very often 
what you need to go to trial. Uh, sometimes it's, it can be a civil standard, which is the next one. Clear and convincing is a, vari a variable standard. Reasonable doubt. If there's no reasonable doubt, then you've got to level of, of guilt. So you can use individual sus suspicion, which consists of your facts and your circumstances, and you can use categorical suspicions. Uh, does someone fit into a broad category of people? And this can be fraught with danger. This can be where we start to see the issues of prejudice. Um, this can be the, where we see you know, unfair racial profiling, also unfair gender profiling. Uh, but remember, we're constantly using these filters to make decisions. Let me give you another example. You come across an individual, there's two individuals, there's an, uh, a standing over a body. One person is 70, uh, five, gray hair, balding, he's got a cane. The other person is 25. There's a person on the ground that's been stabbed. They now move in separate directions. Okay, You can easily catch the guy with the cane, right? But who do you think committed it? Well, you're making an assumption who committed it. And you're saying, well, yeah, it's a reasonable assumption. Okay, why? Are you not committing what's sometimes called ageism? Assuming that um, one's age is reflected of that? At what point do our reasonable observations of the universe move over to the point of this is uh, unacceptable bias? Okay. Categorical suspicions must be coupled with individual suspicions to establish reasonable. So categorical suspicions, remember I mentioned previously, you see someone that's in a neighborhood that is not the typical ethnic or racial group that dominates in that area. That might give you a categorical suspicion. That is something the courts are going to look at very skeptically you're probably going to have to go a little bit further in order to support a search. And the location of the stop can be something that's important. Okay, It can make a difference whether or not the stop is valid. It is clear that it is easier to make these stops in high crime neighborhoods or areas known for drug trafficking. Now be careful here because you know if if I stop you in Wall Street the neighborhood of Wall Street in New York City. That's where almost all bank fraud occurs. Is that going to give me the right to stop anybody that's a suit? You know, oh, well, you know, this is where bank fraud occurs. I can stop and frisk someone for a bank fraud because they might have a gun. You know, that, that's a silly example. Um, but it is a realization that, yes, crime will occur in certain areas. Um, now, some courts are really going to require a little bit more than location. And, and I, I think location by itself is not going to be able to support a search. All right, so frisks and the Fourth Amendment. A lawful frisk has three elements. One, you have a lawful stop, because remember, you have to get that first standard. Two, you have a reasonable suspicion the individual is armed and dangerous. So again, the guy in the bathing suit at the beach, no reasonable suspicion. The guy in the bulky clothes on a cold winter day, more reasonable suspicion. The search is limited to a once-over light pat-down of the outer clothing. It can't be intrusive. It can't be I reached in, pulled out his wallet to see if he had a knife in his wallet. And it is a balance. Okay, The reasonableness of the frisk depends upon the interest of the government in law enforcement and the individual rights to privacy. And again, we get back to that struggle between I want to be safe and I want to be free. Okay, so here's an interesting question. What happens when someone runs? Is fright from flight from a police officer enough to chase and then stop and frisk? So why would you, and you know, I think even more than this before we get there, you'd have to ask what is flight? So you start to walk up to people and they, they begin to walk maybe quickly in the opposite direction. Um, so one of the things we're going to say is um, there should be a level of objective and verifiable data to show that there is a crime potentially happening. Okay, So it's a high crime area, a drug dealing area, a prostitution area. And these areas should be confined in area and time. If you look at, say, for example, I suppose street prostitution is what we're looking at. 
Um, it certainly can happen, but uh, street prostitution tends to not happen during early morning hours. You know, 10 a.m., are you going to see a lot of street prostitutes? You, you could see some, and there are some areas where you would. But no, it, it, it tends to be something more associated with um, a certain time of night and also a certain area. So there should be a connection between what the officer sees and the type of crime you're expecting, why they're running away. All right, so let's look at a case that maybe is of use for this. Um, and, and this case came down in the year 2000. Uh, this is uh, Illinois versus uh, Wardlow. And the, um, the opinion here, again, is it's a Rehnquist opinion, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Warlow was arrested with a 38 caliber handgun. He was spotted in an area where there was heavy narcotics use, and he fled when he was cornered. He was patted down, and they found the weapon. So, <laughs> um, the overall decision said, we can apply Terry here, and we're going to accept that, yes, sometimes innocent people in fact, most of the time, if we start to look at the statistics, the Terry stop's not going to find guilt. Innocent people are going to be stopped. But these minor intrusions, coupled with the area, not enough. But once he ran, that was enough. So the area, okay. Um, but once he ran, Rehnquist said that was enough. Um, now, there was a dissenting opinion. The dissent, again, this was uh, written by uh, Stevens, and uh, it was a 5-4 decision, including with Sotomayor and Ginsburg and Breyer said. Um, there really was a lack of articulable facts for the stop. And since the stop wasn't going to be any good, then the search won't be. Remember, if you can't get, if you can't articulate why the stop's okay, then the frisk is not going to be supportable. Okay, um, and again, if we looked at those, uh, some of those charts um, at the very beginning, if you go to page, um, now my numbers might be a little bit different in the text, 149, and we look at the ratio of stops to arrest by the police department, we got all stops, attempted flight, and then attempted flight in high crime areas. And you'll see that uh, stop to arrest ratio, all stops is only about 9%, attempted flight, 15%, but high crime area, 45%. Um, okay. And then you've also got a breakdown in that chart. Uh, stop and frisk, um, stop, question, frisks, uh, October, December 2012 for uh, a breakdown on black, white, and Hispanic. Now, and, and I will go over this in class. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a stop here and I may do a micro lecture about this is be very careful when you see a chart that says black white Hispanic because um, you're really conflating groups there I know that much of society uses those terms I know those are very common terms terms we're used to but those terms make very little sense uh, together if you say two are racial groups black and white and then you get in the issue of what a race is uh, but one's an ethnic group, Hispanic. So don't you have black Hispanics? Don't you have white Hispanics? What it is? What it? What does it mean to be Hispanic? Um, what does it mean? And of course, you're going to get the issue of what it means to be white and black. But this is something we'll talk about in class. Like I said, I might do a micro lecture. But be a little bit hesitant when you see those charts to see if they really make sense. Okay, so. Um, some critics claim that the lower courts have weakened this reasonable suspicion so much that it's pretty much up to the police. that They can do what they want, and very few frisks get tossed. All right, so the scope of the reasonable frisk. Some frisks need to go no further than just a light pat down. Do you feel a, a hard object inside? Now that gives you a little bit more authority to reach in. Is it a bulky winter clothing? You might have a little bit more reason to reach in. Um, do you have a closed handbag? You know, is it a gun? You might have a little bit reach, more to reach in. Are you going to discover contraband? Because one of the things that's going to happen, if we go back to those original, is um, you're going to find drugs. You know, one of the most common drugs people are arrested for, probably still the most common people drugs are arrested for, 
common drug people arrest for is marijuana. So you're going to pat someone down and let's suppose I feel a soft object in someone's pocket. Well, can I reach in? Well, the, the general answer is no. You know, if you felt like maybe a baggie, okay, because um, people can keep dope in, their, their, in, in a baggie, it's probably not enough because it could be a lot of things. If you felt a crumpled up piece of paper, you couldn't reach in and get it, even if the crumpled up piece of paper might be an illegal betting slip. Um, automatic frisk for evidence or contraband is illegal. So again, if you don't have the probable cause for arrest, because that's different, you can't conduct a frisk. Okay, finding non-weapon contraband. If it is a legal frisk, okay, and you find non-weapon contraband, you can keep it. But the frisk for a weapon can't be a pretext for a search. So here's how it could be done lawfully. If a police officer says, okay, reach into your pockets and turn them out. So I make sure you're not carrying a gun. I don't want to approach you. Uh, I want you essentially to show me you don't have a gun. And when you flip your pocket out, drugs fall out. Well, those drugs are now subject to seizure. But if I pat you down and I feel what could be a pill in your pocket or could be a thing of lint, I can't reach in and get it. All right. Now, one of the things that goes on and one of the things that is confusing for students is, well, what do we do about cars? And I want you to remember when we talked about this earlier, what's your expectation of privacy? If you're in your home, very high. If you're in the mall, lower. If you're in a car, intermediate but still not as high um, without any reason to suspect a police officer is always allowed to order the driver of a car to stop a vehicle um, this is a trivial invasion you can also Marilyn versus Wilson be ordered to get out and to protect their safety you can frisk officers um, now your the suspicion here there has to be reason for the stop okay um, you order them out is fine. If you have no reason to stop a car and you stop and order them out, then you haven't really survived that first. Remember, the stop has to be reasonable. The first part of the stop is reasonable. The search is reasonable. Once you have a lawful reason to stop someone in a car, you can have the driver get out. Now, very often they'll say remain in the car. But if they tell you to get out, you're going to have to get out. You can order the, the passengers out. And to protect them, you can stop and frisk them. And this is Arizona versus Johnson. Now, there can be some special circumstances. Some circumstances require um, more measures to be taken. Uh, officers can order pull over the suspects to get out of their vehicle where their actions can be more easily viewed. The government can detain and frisk people at the border without reasonable suspicion because of national security. Your constitutional rights are very weak at the US border. Because first of all, we don't know if you're a citizen. Uh, we don't know if you're in the area legally. Then we get to the issue, and this could be a whole chapter of roadblocks. Um, can you set up roadblocks? And there was, a, I guess, kind of a bit of a debate whether roadblocks are OK. Roadblocks are OK um, without individualized suspicion so long as you are systemically choosing vehicles. You can't simply say, we had a roadblock and we stopped every person that looked Latino. We had a roadblock, we stopped every person that was a man. That would be insist. But if you had a roadblock that said, we put up the roadblock at 2 a.m. when the bars were closed, and uh, you know we stopped every fifth car, perfectly OK. Perfectly OK. All right final points about these. The court has adopted really a three-pronged balancing test about these roadblocks. What's the gravity of the public interest? What's the effectiveness of this seizure in advancing it? And what's the interference in liberty? So the big, one of the big things is, well, what about DUI checkpoints? And I have to say this, the most dangerous crime people commit is drunk driving. If you look at the number of people killed and injured on the U.S. roads, it's far more dangerous than a lot of things we don't think of. So the courts have said, you know, is this serious? Oh, yes, DWI, DUI, driving well impaired or driving under the influence, doesn't matter what you use, 
um, are you know very dangerous. Conversely, drug interdiction checkpoints typically are not reasonable. Okay, they're much more intrusive. Are drugs bad? Yes. Are drugs as dangerous as drunk driving? No. Now remember, interdiction is not to stop people using drugs and driving because that's DUI. This is stopping people from moving drugs around. Information seeking checkpoints can be reasonable if you have an amber alert and you stop every car you see that has a child in it because there is a missing child, um, that's reasonable. The degree of interference is very minor in most of these. Only when it becomes excessive does the court get really interested. Okay, well, a little bit longer than I like. I like to keep it about 45 minutes or so. We're at an hour, um, but that's the lecture. Uh, whenever you're ready, you can move on to our next chapter, chapter five, and you can hear the dulcimer tones of my voice whenever you're ready again. Have a good day, evening, morning, afternoon, whatever.